I'm excited. So this new series that, that we started this year, we, we didn't start until February, so this is the, actually the fourth message in it. Uh, and the sermon series is called Grow Strong in God's Grace, Learning How to Be a Faithful Farmer for God's Harvest. Okay, and so in the first message, we covered the big picture, which is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. We learned what it means to grow strong in grace. What is God's grace? How do you grow strong in it? And then the second week, we looked at verse 6, which was about the farmer. Paul used the imagery of a hardworking farmer for the Christian life. Okay, so that laid the foundation. So that teaching from the Apostle Paul. Now uh, we're looking at the teaching of Jesus farming imagery. Last week, we looked at some of my favorite passages, John 15, 1 through 8, about the vineyard. We looked at Matthew 11, 28 to 30, uh, about the yoke of Jesus. And we learned how Jesus used farming imagery as illustrations for the spiritual life. Now, today, we're actually going to start looking at the farmer's strategy to bring about a good harvest. And it's a four-step process, okay? It's a four-step process Cultivate the soil is what we're going to look at today. Next week, we're going to look at sow the good seed. Week three, we're going to look at care for the maturing plant. And then we're going to look at week four, reap a hardworking farmer's strategy to bring about a good harvest. You've got to cultivate the soil. Okay, You've got to sow the good seed. You've got to care for the maturing plant. And then you reap a harvest. Really excited about this for us to learn how to be like a hard-working farmer to bring about the harvest for the kingdom of heaven on earth. So this morning, to learn how to cultivate the soil, this first step, I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. This is where we are today. So we've opened up 2 Timothy 2, we've looked at John 15 and Matthew 11, and now we're ready to do four weeks of what is the farmer's strategy? How do we start by cultivating the soil? And this parable is perfect because it's called the parable of the four soils. All right, now, just to let you know what I'm doing here, this is one of the rare moments where we see Jesus explaining one of his parables. Okay, and he does it in two different places in in Matthew 13. So what I've done for you, for ease, is... I am taking Matthew 13, verses 3 to 9, which is where Jesus teaches the parable to a large crowd, okay? And then I'm integrating into that passage Matthew 13, verses 18 to 23, when Jesus had his followers, his disciples with them, and he explained to them, these are what these four soils mean, okay? So if you were reading this on the blog, uh, you would see that I have uh, the... The actual primary parable in bold, and then I have the explanation as a parenthetical note after it. So, but since you're not reading the written page, you can't see that. So I just want you to listen, and, it, and it's going to be clear to you. It's going to make it simpler, actually, because we're not having to read two different texts, and you don't have to figure it out. All right, here we go. God's Word from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 3 through 9, integrated with verses 18 to 23. And Jesus spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower, the farmer, went out to sow. And as he sowed, now remember, sowing here is not like with a little needle to put your button in. This is casting good seed, okay? A sower is a farmer. Sowing is when you cast seed, okay? So, And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. And now Jesus' explanation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Okay, now back to the parable. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth at all. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Jesus' explanation. 
the one in whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Okay, back to the parable of Jesus. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And Jesus explained, And the one in whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then finally, Jesus concludes the parable, And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And he explained, And the one in whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Father, we thank you for the parable of the four soils. We thank you that this is one of those rare moments where you explain the parable to us. Father, we pray that in this time, we will hear a relevant and timely and applicable word from this ancient teaching that we may apply to our lives and into our community, our family, our friends. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, some of you know this, that this same teaching is also found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. I'm not going to go through and read it to you again. Uh, It's the same teaching. So you have it here in Matthew, chapter 13, and then you have it again in Mark, chapter 4. Now, during COVID, you may remember that I was doing a daily devotional for you. And then I put those daily devotionals to the New Testament into a book called Seize the Moment. And I want to read to you the devotional I shared with you uh, during that first year of COVID uh, from Mark chapter 4 because it gives you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. This is kind of the outline I'm going to follow. Okay, here it is. This is from my book, Seize the Moment, uh, the devotional on Mark chapter 4. Friendship is a lot like gardening. It requires you to cultivate the soil to work the ground. In friendship, just like with gardening and growing plants and flowers, you have to know the person well enough to know the state of their soul. Okay, let me pause there. Do you know the state of the soul of the people in your life? Do you know how people are doing? Do you actually take time to listen to the person who's sitting next to you, who you're rubbing shoulders with? And I'm backed. You have to know what each person uniquely needs to grow and be healthy because every person in your life is different. There's no one size fits all, okay? You can't just give everyone a size 13. That's my foot size. That's not gonna work for everyone, okay? Mark chapter four includes the foundational parable of the four soils. And it concludes with Jesus's promise of what his word and spirit will produce in people when their hearts have been cultivated. That's the preparation phase of every good farmer. Cultivate the soil. Mark four verse 20 promises, and so does Matthew 13. And those are the ones in whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. In this parable, Jesus described four types of soils into which the word of God is sown. These soils represent four conditions of people's lives. When the ground is cracked due to being dry and hard, God's love is like a spring shower to soften it. When the topsoil is shallow due to rocks, God's compassion is like rich mulch uh, a farmer's daughter told me that sometimes uh, the things in our lives that we don't like serve as good manure, good fertilizer for the ground. And let me just say, one of the ways God deepens us is by us having to deal with a lot of manure. Because let's be honest, plants don't grow 
and shallow ground. He, and so our character formation, we got to wallow in it. We got, I mean, that's just, I got that from a farmer, okay? I thought it was a great point. I think it's true. It's not just for pastors true. It's for all of us true. So God's compassion is like rich mulch that brings greater depth. When there are thorns and thistle, God's grace ups, uproots sin to heal the land. God is working in every condition. Okay, that is, I'm not going to ask for an amen, but that's an, AM, an amen moment. God's working in every condition of every type of soil condition, of every type of heart. But not every person reacts the same way to God's truth. And that makes friendship hard. That makes marriage hard. That makes relationships hard. That makes parenting and grandparenting hard. It's just because you never know how someone's going to react. Because you may say the same thing to me and say it to someone else and get two different responses. But just like with gardening, it's worth it. Just like with the hardworking farmer, it's worth it. Because what is the focus of the hardworking farmer? It's on the harvest. And so they do the hard work of cultivating the soil because it's worth it. So then I wrote, seize the moment and cultivate the ground of the people in your life. We have been invited to work the garden of God's creation as image bearers, which is what Kurt just shared with us from the communion table. Pray and ask God to help you in your friendships. Okay, and so I'm going to pray for us right now. I want you to think about your relationships I want you to think about your friendships. I want to think about you think about the people you work with and do activities with. And they are all individual people. You can't cookie cut the love of God to your neighbors, to your spouse, to your children, to your grandchildren, to, to those you work with. Every single person needs to be cultivated because they have a different soil. We ask that you give us Holy Spirit, wisdom and discernment to know how to cultivate the soil of every person in our life. Lord, there are people in our lives that have hard soil. There are people in our lives that have shallow soil. There are people in our lives that have thorns and thistles growing in their soil. And then praise God, there are people in our lives that are good soil. Father, you are a scandalous sower and you sow the seed Regardless of the kind of soil condition, help us to do the work of cultivating the soil like hardworking farmers. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now this is the fun part. Okay, what we're going to do now is look at those and look at how do we do it. Okay, it's, now we're going to the how to. Okay, the first soil type that Matthew 13, verses 3 to 4. Jesus said, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed, and some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came out and ate them up. Jesus taught us that some people have hard hearts. Some people have hard hearts. That's the first soil condition. We know these people. Sometimes I am this person. We come in many shapes and sizes. Hard-hearted people are both conservatives and liberals politically. They're of all colors and nationalities. They are fathers and mothers. They are sons and daughters. They are neighbors and co-workers. Okay? So you cannot pigeonhole hard-hearted people as being the people who listen to this network news or listen to that network news or smell like this or look like that or do this or do that. Okay? Okay? Because here's the crazy thing about the soils. They both help us understand different people, but sometimes they help us understand why we react differently, sometimes like followers of Jesus, sometimes not, depending upon the situation. Because I think, my premise is, is that all of us have all four soil conditions in us, depending upon our family of origin issues, our traumas, you know, how we react to certain situations. Some of you are great Christians until you watch the news. Some of y'all are great conditions until your paycheck bounces, right? Some of us are great Christians until someone disrespects you and talks back. Some of you are great Christians until someone pulls a gun on you. You know, there is something that is going to manifest within you that's going to show you that you need the Holy Spirit to work on cultivating your soul. So let me be very clear about something here. We are not talking about us and them at any point in this sermon. 
Yes, there are people who are dominated by their hard-heartedness, but there are all of us who at times act hard-hearted. Okay, now husbands, you are very wise not to say amen. And ladies, same with you. I'm proud of you for being wise in your discretion there. There are the people, the, okay, so hard-hearted people. Once again, disclaimer over, let's get back in. These are the people who don't want to hear. They cannot hear, un- are unwilling to let the truths of God's revelation even, to even be, they don't even want to consider it being relevant to their lives. Some of my dearest loved ones fall into this group. People closest to me fall into this group. And I'm not trying to be sentimental or just, you know, wishy-washy about it. I'm just mean. I love some people that fall in this group deeply. And honestly, as I've already said, sometimes I'm in this group and sometimes you're in this group. So, Father, I pray, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this is why I love, and we're going to talk about this more next week, that's why I love the image of, of God being a scandalous sower. Because God doesn't prejudge you as being unable to receive his word. He just sows. He just sows. So guys, you don't need to know always. You, just, you need to sow the seed. You just need to cast the good seed what, G, what Jesus illustrates in this parable doesn't make good economic sense by corporate farming standards today. No farmer would sow the seed in the same way that this parable illustrates how it's sown. Because nowadays it is like GPS driven. It is very, but this image, this is God's sowing. He is putting the seed out there. But what's going on with these hard hearted people? That even as God sows seed, it just lands on that hard heart and then the birds come and snatch it away. The evil one takes it away. What's our responsibility here? And it's simple. Ready? It's simple, but it's hard. We must pray and we must love. What do you do with a hard-hearted person? You pray. And then you pray some more. And then you keep praying. And you look for every opportunity to love to keep the door open so that upon repentance, they can come back, that they can return. Doesn't mean you enable them. It doesn't mean you go along with them in their folly, but you pray and you pray. And you show love. And that love is speaking the truth in grace. Because praying is never in vain. Loving is never in vain. Through time and perseverance, water changes landscapes. You know that's true, right, in the natural? Through time, water changes landscapes. Guess what also changes time, changes things through time? Prayer and love. You got a hard-hearted person in your life? Pray and love and trust that faith moves mountains. With a faith just the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So let us pray, Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Amen? The second soil condition. The second soil condition comes from Matthew 13, verses 5 to 6. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, And because they had no root, they withered away. Okay? The second group of people that Jesus tells us we need to cultivate are people who make shallow commitments. People who make shallow commitments. Now, this is the reality of American Christianity. And please know when I do this, I don't do it as a prophet nor the son of a prophet. I don't do it as I'm better than the church of our nation. I'm just saying this is where we're at, church. The reality of American Christianity is that a large percentage of new converts will fall away, not because of their lack of sincerity at the moment of their conversion, but because we as the local church have failed to teach and equip them on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
This is our sin of omission in the great commission. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20, that upon baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to teach them to observe everything he's commanded. And the great omission in the Great Commission is that we have been happy to see, we've been happy to go and make disciples of all nations, and we have been happy to baptize them according to whatever tradition and however we baptize in that tradition. But have we followed through to help people who have made sincere decisions to deepen their decisions, to deepen that sincere, that sincere conversion so it's not shallow, so it's not rocky, we have that responsibility. And that's just not a me thing. That's an us thing. You can't bail on this and say that's the hired guy's job. We are so responsible for one another. We are our brother's keeper. And we have to help one another to make deeper commitments to Christ. This is a call for repentance from the church. We must disciple people from the very beginning, teaching them the commandments of Jesus and how to obey them. So for people with hard hearts, we pray and we love. And we keep setting the conditions for that water of God's grace to break up that ground. And then for where there's shallow soil and rocky ground, we invite those people into our lives to teach them, to disciple them, to how to take, go deeper in their relationship with God. The key is real life discipleship, not institutional discipleship, but real life discipleship. Brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters, couples with couples, families with families, doing life together, learning from one another. And you don't need a college degree to do this. Sometimes you're just one step ahead. Sometimes you're not even a step ahead. You're just willing to walk along with somebody. Paul taught this in 2 Timothy 2.2. Paul said, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who, who will be able to teach others also. In the same way that we don't leave newborns unattended to make it. Good job, kid, you were born, now get to it. Doesn't make sense. Once again, these things make sense in the natural, all right? It makes sense that water can change landscape in the natural. Why don't we believe that prayer and love can change landscape too, all right? We, we know you don't let a newborn, and let's be honest, you don't even let a tween go at it alone. You want to see mass chaos, let the middle schoolers of Newcastle run, this, run the place. All right, and all the teachers and administrators said, amen. Is that a little too close to home? But, you know, we don't leave newborns unattended to make it on their own. In the same way, we shouldn't let fledgling new couples. I do premarital counseling, and then I try to do a follow-up, but even that is not enough. It is hard to figure out life. It is hard to figure out marriage. I mean, so often places like the military and, and then corporations that have good mentorship programs, they get this better than the church does. We must provide loving care and provision for those who would otherwise fall away from the faith within those first days, weeks, months of their rebirth. Because when you're born again, it's like being a baby again. Op your eyes are open to spiritual realities, to the kingdom of heaven on earth, and it's strange and it's different, and the morals and ethics of this kingdom are different than the world's. And this, I believe, is the difference between those who are scorched by the sun and those through the watering of the word grow deeper roots. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our congregation and for each person here, that if there's someone here who finds themselves in a place, maybe not even by their own choosing, that they made a sincere decision to follow Jesus, but find themselves in a shallow level of commitment to that decision. I pray that, one, <laughs> I pray the Spirit of God would give you the courage to, to talk to a beloved brother or sister in Christ, to talk to a friend or family member, to talk to your spouse, to talk 
to me or one of the elders, to talk to your small group leader or Sunday school class, or to start attending one. And I pray now for all the people that we won't look at this as a, well, this is the institutional church's problem and not mine. I'm too busy. That is a shallow commitment as well. I pray that we, as the members of the body of Christ, as born-again believers, will take it upon ourselves to, one, be honest with ourselves about the level of commitment we've made to that sincere decision to follow Jesus, and that we will then partner and make ourselves available to others so that we may grow deeper together. In Jesus' name, amen. Third, the third soil type, ready? Matthew 13, verse 7. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. Okay, you ready for this one? This one's going to hurt a little bit. This one's going to be looking in the mirror. Jesus described that some people live busy and distracted lives. We live in a 25-8 culture. You've heard of a 24-7 culture? Well, we live in a 25-8 culture. Everyone's trying to fit Eight days worth of stuff in seven days, and everyone's trying to find an extra hour every single day of their life. We are busy and distracted people. And Jesus is being honest with us here. Do you know what keeps most of the people who attend churches through our communities from being faithful farmers for the harvest? Good stuff. A lot of good stuff. A lot of really good stuff. No judgment here. This is just welcome, welcome to real world. Okay, no judgment. But we are busy, distracted people. Jesus enlisted us to be soldiers for Christ and not to be distracted by civilian affairs. Jesus said that we are to be like hardworking farmers who look forward to receiving the first produce. Jesus said we're supposed to, uh, Paul said we're supposed to be like athletes who are training to finish the race in such a way as not to be disqualified from receiving that crown of glory. We're to be disciplined, diligent, dedicated. That's what Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 6, that was, if you haven't listened to it, that was the first message in this series to remind us that Paul used those three occupational metaphors, those three uh, illustrations to us of this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. You're going to be like an athlete who's going to the Olympics. You're going to be like a soldier who is a part of an elite army, a Marine. You're going to be like a farmer who is dedicated and hardworking for the harvest. It is so easy. Let's just confess this. Lord, I confess. It is so easy to pack my life with so many activities and interests that there is no time left for you and your mission. Lord, Help rescue us from FOMO, F-O-M-O, FOMO, the fear of missing opportunities. Lord, rescue us from FOMO and give us JOMO, the joy of missed opportunities. Replace the fear of missing out on something great for our kids, of missing out on the next wonderful thing that all the cool people are doing in the city. Sometimes we in the rural areas, Lord, are more caught up with keeping up with others because we already feel insecure about our place in life. But Lord, you have given us this beautiful rural community so that we can rest in the easy yoke, so that we cannot live in the frenetic 25-8 lifestyle of cities. Lord, let us seize the moment where we live and embrace the seasons. Winter is beautiful because it makes us slow down. Thank you for the warm weather, by the way. So I want you to recognize that there is joy in missing out on opportunities. Don't live fearful, insecure lives that keep you going so busy, so frenetic, so 25-8 that you can't spend time with God and allow him to deal with the rocks and the thorns and the thistles. And this is a call to mutual submission as fellow farmers. This is the call to accountability, okay? So if prayer and love is what we do with hard hearts and discipleship and life on life, real life discipleship is what we do with shallow commitments, then what do we do when there's thorns and thistles? 
we mutually submit to one another in love with gentleness to hold each other accountable. This is the weeding that I told you I don't like to do in gardening because this is the weeding I don't like to do in relationships. I like to be the nice guy. Doing great. But there are so many times where we're not doing great because the weeds are choking the life out of our lives. And we know it. Just tell me the truth. Just be honest with me. This is not good for my soul. But there are things that will lead us to thriving, to being blessed. We have so often left our fields, we have let our fields lay fallow. We have let our fields lay unattended, that we're not cultivating the soil in preparation for the casting of good seed. Why? Because we're flipping through our screens. I mean, how many kids are running off in parks because parents or caregivers weren't looking up to see them be like, my kid. And I'm not judging anyone, therefore goes I. Within the family of God, we are called to mutual submission, accountability, during discipleship, in our Sunday school classes, in our ministry teams, in our small groups, in our friendship circles. Did you know that if your friend shows up to visit you to the hospital, the church has shown up to visit you in the hospital? Friends, be friends. I so rely upon you to actually care about the people you call friends. And I care about you being mature enough to recognize that when your friends and family who love Jesus show up, you are getting good care. And yes, we want to be there too. This is not an excuse to try to do the best we can in caregiving and pastoral care. But brothers and sisters, if you want quality care and deep discipleship and mutual submission, then mature and start doing it. You cannot be spoon-fed once a week. And even though I'm doing all those phone calls too, that's not enough. You need each other. I need you to need each other. I need you to want to need each other. And I can't motivate motivation. But the Holy Spirit can. So I pray right now that if there's anyone who finds themselves busy and distracted, if they find themselves so busy and distracted, they say, yeah, my friend's in the hospital, but I'm too busy with this. Pastor will go see them. Or their Sunday school class teacher will go see them. Or some elder or someone else will go see them. But they're your friend. This is your friend. This is your family member. That's your mother. That's your child. I pray, Father God, that you, God, would stir within us to, to set our priorities right. Lord, what good is it to gain the whole world yet forfeit our souls? What good is it, Lord, if, we've, if we sent off our kids to a great college on a scholarship, but they don't love Jesus and they're running in the ways of the world? Oh, Father, teach us that we get such small opportunities with our, our, our spouses. We have so many limited opportunities with our children. We have such limited opportunities with our friends and our families. Our parents and grandparents are only going to be here so long. God, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have let lesser things take over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I call you out this morning to cultivate the soil for God to bear the good fruit of the spirit in your lives and in the lives of others so that we can see good fruit so that people can see this is the kingdom of heaven on earth and if I if I desire for your life to reap an abundant harvest and you desire for my life and my ministry to reap an abundant harvest then we owe it we owe it to one another to constantly be working the ground through prayer and love, real life discipleship, and mutual submission to accountability to the teaching of God's word. That is the great commission. It's not impersonal, fear-based evangelism that makes some convert. It is relationship investment with that person so that you know them well enough to know the state of their soul, to walk with them, to care for them, and guess what? You never outgrow that need. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for one day, one month, or 25 years, or 50 years, or 75 years. You never outgrow the need for these things. You never outgrow the need for love and prayer, because can't we all be a bit hard-hearted? There should be more than one amen in the room. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate your sincerity. 
And we all agree, by the way. That was a joke. Anyways, that was a bad one. You know, but don't we all need that? And don't we all agree that we need someone to take us deeper? You know? And then don't we all need someone to be humble with? Humility. You can say you're the most humble person in the world, but until you're, listening to, until you're willing to listen to someone help you get better in an area, you'll know how humble you are when someone brings loving, graceful accountability to your life. Ed? Are you just saying yes, I agree, or you want to say something? Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Good. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. That's what Ed the farmer just said. And let's go look at that fourth point now. And I want to say one last thing about that thorny soil. Deep under the ground are these systems, these root systems that just pop up, don't they? If anybody's gardened before and you've tilled and you have put compost down and you have weeded, where in the world does this thing come from? When there are volunteer tomato plants, we're like, woo, I got a volunteer tomato plant. But when it's like that thorn or thistle system that just will not go away year after year, that is called like a habitual sin or a hang up or a hurt. There's something deep there. Sometimes you need a Christian counselor. Sometimes you need a spiritual director. Sometimes you need a brother or sister you can go really deep with. Because sometimes we got some thorn and thistle root systems that are deep in our soul from a childhood trauma when someone hurt us. And we need professional help. So I want to say there are times where you not only need mutual submission in this family, sometimes you need to go get some help and say, I'm going to bear my soul to you. Would you please be gentle with me and get this out of me? Because I keep returning to this thing, this attitude, this behavior. I keep dating the same kind of guy or I keep returning to this same kind of you know, sin in my life. I, help me. True? Fourth. Fourth and the final. Matthew 13, verse 8. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop. And here it is. We love this. Are you a 30, a 60, or a 100-fold Christian? Don't you love that question? Hi, my name's Jerry. Are you a 30, a 60, or a 100-fold Christian? And you're like, well, I'm actually shallow soil. Thanks for asking. Do you can go talk about it? No, we don't ask. We don't ask if you're hard-hearted. We don't ask if you're shallow commitment. We don't ask if, if you're weedy. We just go up to you and say, we assume you're a good soul. Hey, good soul, are you 30, 60, or 100-fold? Well, last week I was 100-fold. This week I feel a little bit more like 30. Must be getting old. No, but you know, we want to be this last crop. Every single person in the room thinks they're this and wants to be this. Because we self-justify when we're hard-hearted, when we're shallow, and when we're weedy. But we don't do that for others. We just judge them. We make excuses for ourselves, but we're quick to judge someone else. Friends, we all want to be this. We all, Jesus said that some people will live focused lives as hardworking farmers. And praise the Lord, we're going to be ending on this hope and this prayer and this dream that we, too, will be productive for the harvest. Jesus teaches that when the good seed lands in people who fully commit themselves to the kingdom of God, to the king of kings and his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, then he will bear fruit upon their branches. That if you abide in him and he abides in you, you will bear fruit. You will prove to be his disciple, how? By bearing fruit. Okay, this is the promise of Jesus. And my Jesus said that he will bring to gun in you. So my belief is, is that if you have a sincere conversion, if you have a sincere commitment to Jesus Christ, that as you intentionally work through your hard-heartedness, your sh areas of shallow commitment, and your areas of being busy and distracted, and your areas of having weeds and systems in your life, that you will become more and more increasingly fruitful in your life. Because to me, the question isn't whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. The question to me isn't whether or not you're a Christian. It's whether you're giving God full access to bear good fruit. That you're saying, Lord, I've got this thing going on and it's manifesting weeds. But I know if, if you get to the root of that, you're going to uproot that. And I'm going to be more and more of a person who bears good fruit. I know that. Jesus desires for you to hear him today and answer the call of discipleship. In Matthew, excuse me, in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus says, follow me.
and I will make you become fishers of men. Let me restate that for you. Follow me, and I'll make you become good soil. Follow me, and I will prove to the world that I exist through you, because you're going to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit on your branch. And so follow the strategy of a faithful farmer and cultivate the soil in preparation for the sowing of the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you find yourself stuck in something other than good soil, preach the gospel to yourself. Do you know what one of the greatest spiritual disciplines is? It's preaching the gospel to yourself. Believing your own story. I'm a born again believer. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Whoa. Now... Now live it. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you all to experience the miracle of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm going to pray that God is going to cultivate the souls of your heart. So Father, we pray that the good seeds of the word of God will grow in our minds and hearts. Lord, we pray that a great faith will prevail within each of us over all evil, a faith that perseveres through these dark days. Lord, your word promises that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Holy Spirit, activate within each and every person this morning. Activate their faith, Father. May your grace be our sufficiency. May you be enough. And in our weaknesses, may we be strong because you fill our cup to overflowing with your power, your presence, your peace, your shalom. Jehovah shalom, come and give us a peace that takes our hearts and minds deeper in you. Lord, we confess that we are sinners. And so we come to you who are righteous and just and we ask you to forgive us of our sins. And you promise that the shed blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so Lord, take this field. Take this field that you have, you have legal rights. You have bought this field. Every single person here, I want you to imagine this. Your heart, your mind, your life, your relationships, your workplace is a field. And guess who bought that field? You have been bought at a price. Jesus Christ has legal rights over the field of your life. And right now, I want everybody to ask the Holy Spirit to cultivate the soil of their field. Good farmer, God, cultivate the soil of my field that you bought through your shed blood on the cross of Calvary. I belong to you. My heart, mind, body, and soul belong to you. Lord, if there's a hard, beaten place in my life, Lord, please soften it. If there's shallow places in my mind and heart and body and soul, then deepen it. If there's deep thorns and thistles, root systems in my life, then Lord, go deep and take them all up. Get rid of all those weeds, Lord. I want to be good soil. And now may the joy of your salvation, may the joy of his salvation be your strength as we learn to work hard as good farmers. Oh, Father, we ask that until all worship, until all nations come to you, that we will continue to be faithful to the harvest. We respond to your invitation for workers and we say, yes, Lord, I wanna work in your harvest. I wanna go where you send me. I wanna do what you tell me. And I wanna start right here. In my heart, my mind, my religion, see that be a ripple effect. I want First Baptist Church of Newcastle, Indiana. I want Henry County of East Central Indiana. I want this nation to be an epicenter of revival. And it begins right here in this place of repentance and confession and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.